Philippians chapter 2. We're in uh, verse 12, going to be reading through verse 18. Let's read it. And it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word. And we pray that you would open our hearts to it today and that you would help us to understand what you're saying and then also to apply this word to our lives. You are the teacher. We sit at your feet. Teach us today, O Lord God, in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. As Paul gets into this section of his letter to the Philippians, he begins to speak to them about obedience. And he says to them, even as you have obeyed when I'm around, I want to encourage you to also obey when I'm not around. Right? And he says, in the midst of that, I want you to Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Before we talk about what that means, let's clear up any misunderstandings about what it does not mean. Because Paul is not saying, work for your salvation. If he were, he would be contradicting himself, frankly. Because elsewhere, he said the exact opposite. Let me show it to you on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, you know this. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is is not your own doing. (laughs) Pretty clear there. He goes on to say, it's the gift of God. And it is not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So since we know that Paul is not reversing himself here in Philippians, and we know he's not saying, work for your salvation, now we can ask ourselves, what is he saying? Well, the single Greek word that is translated here, work out, for it, where he says, work out your salvation, means to produce or to accomplish, okay? In our American vernacular, we would say something like, walk it out, make it a reality, right? So Paul is saying, walk out your salvation, walk it out to completion, right? Uh, with fear and trembling. The other thing you need to understand about his usage of the word salvation here. Guys, salvation doesn't always refer to eternal salvation. When the Bible uses that word, it can have different shades of meaning. And in this particular case, the word salvation refers to simply your life in Christ that you walk out every single day. That's what he's referring to. He's saying, walk out your life in Christ. Walk it out in obedience to the Lord um, and, and, and live it to completion and so forth. So it's all about shining our light for Christ while we're doing the things that we need to do to stay out of trouble, you know. That's another part of walking out your salvation. It's living your life in such a way not so close to the edge that when temptation comes along, you fall off that edge. Rather, he's saying, walk out, live out your salvation in such a way that you understand the pitfalls and the difficulties and the challenges that come your way as a Christian so that you can walk it out and and, and in so doing, shine your light for Jesus Christ. And that's, you can see that's huge. And just in case you think that all this walking out of your uh, salvation in Christ is all up to you, Notice that he goes on in verse 13 to say, for it is God who works in you, both to have the will, right, to walk out your salvation, and then also to do, he says, to work for his good pleasure. What he's talking about is the the, the Holy Spirit living within you and living within me. 
He's talking about you and I relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to give us the will and the power to walk out our Christian lives. You know, when you think about those things, have you ever had a desire to do God's will? <laughs> That's Him. That's Him doing that in you. It's Him who works in you to will. To, that means to desire to do it and then to walk it out. Let me show you how Peter describes this. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So interesting, isn't it, that here in Philippians, he says, God is God who works in you to will and to walk out or work out his good pleasure. And then we see here in 2 Peter that his divine power has given us not most of what you need, it's given you everything you need for life, which is the continuation of life, and godliness, which is Christ-likeness. He's given you everything you need. Do you know what, you know what God just did to you and me between these two passages? He literally robbed us of every excuse that we could possibly throw in his face about why we couldn't obey. He absolutely took it away. And now you and I have nobody to blame but ourselves if we walk into sin. Because as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, the Bible makes it very clear. God has done his part, and he's given you and I everything we need to walk in victory over sin. Now, the fact of the matter is, we don't walk every day in victory over sin, do we? That's just the reality of the situation. But the, but the point here that we're making is that it's not God's fault. It's because you and I have made a decision or, or, or a choice to go against his will. It's, it's, it's basically that battle of the wills, you know. Again, here in Philippians, Paul says, it is God who works in you to will. Well, sometimes my will comes up against God's will. And my will is the contrary to him. And I, and, 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 and I say, no. And you know what's interesting about that? I don't know if it's interesting or not. He lets me. He lets me say no. He lets me oppose his will. And the reason he lets you and me oppose his will is because our will is part and parcel of that freedom that he has given to us to choose our path. It is what makes us uniquely created in the image of God, that free moral choice. And he's not going to take it away. Because it makes you part of who you are. It is the essence of who you are created in his image. And so he's not going to remove it. I sometimes wish he would, but he won't. And he will let you and I set our will against his. The fact of the matter is, he will also allow us to experience the consequences of setting our will against his and, and, and so forth. But, you know. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing you know, that you're hearing here that you haven't heard before. You, you've always known that when, when it comes to living a righteous life, you were the weak link in that chain, right? I mean, we all, we all knew that, you know. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so we know that it's us. It's us who struggle sometimes to, to merge our will with God's will. And that's why Paul is encouraging the Philippians here, and of course, obviously encouraging you and I through that, to walk it out. Walk out the reality of that obedience. Walk it out, he says. He says, I know, I know that your will fights against the will of the Lord sometimes. So walk it out. Live it out. Right? Here's the point. The very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave is the power that now resides in you and I to walk out our Daily life in him. And believe me, that power is enough for you and I to conquer sin. But here's, here's the problem. It's not automatic. 
I wish it was. I wished when I got saved, there was just this switch that got flipped in me that went from darkness to light where I now used to live in darkness and now I always live in the light. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I can choose to go back and wallow in the darkness if I want to. And believe me, in the many years that I've walked with Jesus, I have. And I know you have too. But when that happens, it is our own decision to walk backwards. And that's why Paul tells us to not just walk out our life in Christ, but to walk it out with fear and trembling. That's so important that we understand what that means. Because fear and trembling is an attitude of the heart that says, I can't do this without you. To fear God and to tremble before him is to say, Lord, I am weak in and of myself and I cannot live this Christian life apart from you. And, and, and I know that we all try to do that from time to time. We all try to be a good Christian. People say it to me sometimes when they come and they've just gone through some kind of a failure uh, uh, of sin re, you know, related to walking with the Lord. And, and they say, Pastor, you know, I'm, I don't know why I did this. I'm trying. I'm trying every day. And I get it. I understand what you're saying. You're trying. And what fear and trembling tells us is, my trying isn't enough. I need to walk it out by faith, not by effort. Listen, the Christian life is not lived by your effort, and by gritting your teeth and gutting it out and saying, we're going to do this thing. <laughs> it's fear and trembling, you guys. It's coming before the Lord on bended knee and saying, Jesus, I can't, but you can. Right? It's literally admitting your weakness. I can't live the Christian life. I can't do it. I can't be the husband my wife needs. I can't be the father my children need. I can't be the pastor and teacher that you need apart from Jesus. It's only through his power. Only through his ability. See? Now, that ought to set you free. I hope it does. Because when you walk it out, you begin to just walk out what God has already done in you. He's already given you the ability to both will and to work according to his good purpose. It's already there. You don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to prevail upon him to give it to you. It's there. Now walk it out. But not by effort. By the power of the Spirit. Humbly. Fearfully. Trembling before him. Lord, only you can do this. Only you can enable me to live this life that you've called me to. Only you. I can't. I cannot do this. So Paul goes on here and he begins to describe some actions that are consistent with walking out your salvation. Let's look at what he says here in verse 14. He says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. Don't you hate this verse? What I'm doing is I'm complaining about it. <laughs> Do all things without grumbling and complaining that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. And by the way, Christians are still living amidst a crooked and twisted generation. Among whom you, as a believer, shine as lights in the world. It's funny, isn't it? Of all the sins and vices Paul could have pointed to as it relates to walking out our salvation, he brings up these. Grumbling and complaining. Grumbling and, and quarreling, actually. The first one he talks about is grumbling, which is the same as complaining. Uh, and then he talks about disputing here in the ESV. Your Bible, Bible may say arguing or quarreling. Paul basically tells us to stop uh, arguing and stop complaining. Nobody likes to be around a complainer. We all kind of know that because, you know, they're just constantly, you know, a Debbie Downer all, all day long talking about everything that's rotten and bad and, and, and stuff like that. But here's the point. It's even more so a serious matter for believers to be complainers because, you see, the Greek word that we translate complainer literally means one who is discontented with his life. So you see, when you and I complain to others, especially unbelievers, what we're doing is we're preaching. We're preaching. And we're telling people we're not satisfied with God. 
I'm not satisfied with the way he's treating me. I'm not satisfied with the things he's given me. I'm just not satisfied. I'm not content. And I'm going to complain about it. Believe me, that's not the kind of preaching that we want to do. The fact is, it's unbecoming of a Christian. Complaining. It's unbecoming. And it shows just how worldly we still are if we're constantly giving in to complaining. Because here's the deal. You and I have the best father in the universe. He has promised us that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And he never will. But for you and I to complain about what's going on in our lives is essentially to declare to others our lack of faith in God and his ability to take care of us and to be that loving father that he has promised to be. And that's a pretty serious issue. And we need to think long and hard before we complain. We need to think about what we're saying about God to others. Wouldn't it be great if when somebody was complaining, we just turned to him and said, so what are you telling me about God? Well, I'm not telling you anything about God. I'm telling you about my circumstances. Yeah, I know, but isn't he the Lord of your life? Yeah. Doesn't that mean he's the Lord of your circumstances? I suppose. So what are you telling me about God? Get it? Yeah. The other way that Paul encourages us to walk out our salvation is by not arguing or quarreling. You remember when you'd get into an argument with your sibling or something like that, and your parent would come along and say, all right, what started this? And we, of course, you both point to the other person. He said, and then you tell him what happened, or he, he did this, or, you know, or she, she, if she wouldn't have just, you know, sort of thing. And, and, you know, that kind of carries over into our adulthood. We think that arguments are caused by the other person. <laughs> but James tells us what causes arguments. And it's kind of in your face because James kind of a, he's kind of an in your face kind of a guy. Let me show you. James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire... Right? You have all these desires and you don't have. So you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, meaning you don't come to God. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So, you know, I just, that's one thing I love about God's word. It just doesn't mince words with us and try to, you know, wrap it up in flowers, it just kind of says, here's the deal. If you're getting into all these arguments and quarrels, here's why. Here's what started it. Your evil heart. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be something if someone admitted that? Somebody walks in the room when you're arguing with someone, all right, what started this argument anyway? Well, my evil heart. It's true. I mean, that's the fact, isn't it? It's my, it's my evil heart that started it, and, and, and that's why it's happening. And that means that when I'm walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh, I can resist the temptation to enter into an argument or a quarrel, which, by the way, always takes two people. And I can say, no, I'm not going there. So... We see here what we're not supposed to do. What are we supposed to do? Verse 16, look with me in your Bible. Holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I didn't run in vain or labor in vain. So Paul tells us that an essential part of walking out our salvation with fear and trembling is holding fast to the word. By the way, this, this term, uh, holding fast, this is one of Paul's favorite phrases. Let me show you other times when he used it. You can see it in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 where he said, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings that we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15.2, 
by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. And 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything and hold fast to that which is good. So it's pretty clear this is a pretty common phrase used by the Apostle Paul. Here's the question. What does it mean? If I tell you to hold fast, what am I saying? Well, interestingly enough, hold fast translates a word in the Greek that means two essential things. First of all, it means to hold your position. <clears throat> Just <clears throat> stay there. And then secondly, it means to hold your gaze. Okay? To hold your gaze. Remember when Peter and John were walking to the temple to, at the time of prayer and it says there was a man that was begging there and, and, and Peter and John walked up to him and said, look at us, because they wanted his attention. And the Bible says he fixed his gaze on them. It's this, this exact Greek word. Now, Paul is saying do this to the word. Okay? First of all, be unmoved, stay and then fix your gaze. Hold fast to the word. He's saying, stay with it, right? Stay with the word. Fix your mind on the word of life. Stay connected with the word of life. So what are we talking about here? Are we talking about just reading your Bible? You know, we, we encourage people to read their Bible. We encourage people to read through the Bible, you know, in a year or two years or whatever. It's like, you know, you, we all ought to be constantly reading through our Bibles. But the thing that you got to understand about this, reading through the Bible is wonderful, but it's not magical. And, 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 and what we're talking about when we say hold fast to the word of life is more than just reading your Bible, Okay. The, the, the Pharisees knew the word. They had read the scriptures, and yet Jesus constantly rebuked them for their hard-heartedness and their stubborn pride. And so we're obviously talking about more than that, and that is why the Apostle Paul, when he prayed for believers, he prayed for more than just them reading the word. Let me show you this. It's from Ephesians chapter 1. This is Paul's prayer. He prays. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. That's why Paul prayed that prayer, because just reading the Bible isn't enough. There are liberal scholars who have read through the scriptures from beginning to end, and they have walked away unchanged and untransformed by the word of God. Why? Because their hearts have not been enlightened. They have not received a revelation of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and they do not understand the hope to which they have been called, you see. I found a, a, a wonderful quote uh, that I wanted to share with you here, one I agree with. John Piper said this. He said, the Bible is infinitely precious and also the infallible word of God. But if the living God does not open our hearts, we can read it 100 hours a week and never see the glory of what it says or the one who gave it. I think that's an excellent quote. I really do. And that's one of the reasons why every time here on a Sunday or Wednesday before we get into the Word, we always pray. It's not just that we're doing it because it's time to pray before we... It's not like we're following some, you know... Thing. No, we're praying because we need God to open our eyes. We need God to give us the ability to receive what His Word has to say because otherwise it's just going to you know, bounce right off our hearts. And, and have you ever read the Bible? And kind of walked away and closed it and went, hmm, that was, uh, I'm not even sure what I read. You ever had that happen? Yeah, me too. You think that doesn't happen to me? Sure it does. The point is, my heart isn't always in a place to receive from God's word. There are times I open up my Bible and I read through a chapter and my heart's just not in a place to receive. And it's like, <sighs> Well, that was kind of a waste of time. 
We have this idea somehow that there's this magical thing that happens whenever we open the Bible and I read it, you know. Lord, I need you to open my eyes. I need you to open my heart. I need you to fill me, you know, with understanding. Finally, Paul says in verses 17 and 18, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Interesting here, he refers to his life, his ministry, his effort as being poured out like a drink offering. Um, this was known to the Jews. Actually, pagans did drink offerings too. But in the, in the law, there was a, a, an element uh, related to the offering where when an animal was on the sacrificial altar, uh, someone would pour out a drink offering and it was usually wine that would be poured either on the offering or next to it. And the thing that was interesting about a drink offering is it was poured out and then it was gone. There was really nothing left to, to even show that an offering had ever even been made. And that's the way Paul saw his life. He saw his life as something that was being poured out. He actually used this metaphor one other time when he wrote to Timothy, speaking of his impending martyrdom in Rome. But he saw his life that way, as something that was poured out for the Lord, given completely and totally to the Lord. And as sad as it might sound when speaking of a life to say that life was poured out, Paul relates it to rejoicing and gladness. Did you catch that? He says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, I'm glad and I rejoice and you ought to be glad and you ought to rejoice too. Here's why. Here's why. Paul understood the principle that when you give your life, when you pour your life out for the Lord, you receive your life. When you seek to hold on to your life and retain it for yourself, you lose it. Isn't that what Jesus says? Isn't that what we're given in the, in the Gospels? If you seek to save your life, you will lose it. But if you pour it out, if you give your life for my sake, you will find it. And at that point, the pouring out of a life becomes an opportunity for gladness and rejoicing. You know what's interesting about that? In a fleshly sort of a sense, my natural tendency is to hang on to my life. It's to hang on to everything that I've ever been given, including my number of days. I'm just hanging on to it, holding on to it, you know, with all I'm worth. That's the flesh. That's the life of the flesh, to seek to save your life. But the work of the Spirit in you and I is to pour our lives out, literally to give them away, to spend them on behalf of others. And Jesus is telling us in the Gospels, and Paul is reiterating here, that it's a matter of great gladness and rejoicing because that is the path to finding your life, is to have it being poured out and given completely to the Lord. So a life given is a life gained. I just listening to a vet do the program announcement last week, and Chris and Jeremy and Roger. It's just so many gifted uh, communicators, but more than communicators, they are shepherds and teachers of the Word of God. So I feel very blessed to be with them, with you. To those of you who are gathered here, those of you watching online, whenever, wherever you may be watching, let's turn together to the book of Philippians chapter 2 as we continue our study through Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Very early in the model prayer, Jesus instructs his followers that we should pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Familiar language to all of us, amen? What we may neglect to contemplate 
is that those words answer the great existential question. The great existential question being, what does God want to do with my life, in my life, through my life, is answered by that prayer. That as we seek to do God's will, as Jesus does the Father's will, we answer the great existential question. We discover what God wants to do in and through our lives. As we are living his will, he is glorified and he deserves to be glorified. And you will be satisfied. And for many of us, the, the challenge is how do we do that? How do we discover God's will? How do we actually live God's will when there's this conflict between our will, self, and God's will that is prevalent? And this is what we are going to discover together today. If you would, we're in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 13. And I'm going to ask you to follow along as we go through to verse 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray. Father, you have gathered us here to speak to us, to teach us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to comfort us, to transform us to be more like you. And I pray, Father, as we lift up the name of Jesus, as we sit at your feet to learn from you, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hands and feet to do. Speak, Lord, for your servants delight to hear your voice. And we pray this now, in Jesus' name, amen. The subject that we're going to talk about this morning is the work of God, the work of God. And really the objective that I think God intends for us is that we would do God's will, that we would do God's will. Now, first, we're going to consider the work of God at verses 12 and 13. And here, what I want you to see with me is you work to do God's will. You work to do God's will. So Paul begins at verse 11, and he starts this section and says, therefore. Now, whenever we see the word therefore, we should ask ourselves, what is it therefore? Amen? Amen. Now, as Anthony shared with us last Sunday in verses 1 through 11, there was some disunity in the church of Philippi. We'll see more of that when we get to the fourth chapter. And Paul understands that the antidote for that unity is selfless, sacrificial service to God by serving others. And so he encourages them, beginning at verse 1, he reminds them, if you've experienced the consolation, the comfort of God, if you've experienced the mercy and affection of God, if you have experienced the strengthening, the encouragement of God, if you have sensed the fellowship of God's Spirit, God's Spirit moving in your midst and moving in a community of faith, if those things are present, and aren't they present here? Oh, that was lame sauce, people. Are they not present here? Yes, and because we have experienced those things and we know that reality of his affection, his love, his mercy, his comfort, his strengthening, because those are a reality, 
then we are to maintain this unity of the body of Christ. And the way that we maintain this unity of the body of Christ is by following Jesus' example. And so Paul brings out that Christ humbled himself. He left his heavenly perfection to come to this world. And he humbled himself in every way through his life and death and resurrection. And throughout his ministry, as we explore it in the Gospels, as we discover more of it in the book of Acts and the Epistles, we see that Jesus always puts the needs of others before his own. That is his humility. It is not a sense that Jesus is all proud and he's got to stop being proud. He is humbling himself, not availing himself of the privileges he deserves. If there is anyone in the universe who deserves to be served, it is Jesus. And rather than coming to this earth to be served, he declared that I did not come to be served, but to serve others and to give myself as a, lot, as a ransom for many. And this is the attitude that we are exhorted to have. Humble, selfless, sacrificial service to God by serving others. And then Paul reminds us of verses 9 to 11, the reason why we do this is because Jesus is Lord. And every tongue and every knee shall bow and confess that he is Lord ultimately. And everything that Jesus did, he did to glorify God. That's how Paul begins. He said, therefore, he said, whether I am with you, and I know when I was with you, you sought to obey and do God's will, and even more so now when I'm not physically present with you, I am confident that you're seeking to obey the Lord. And those of you who have been unable to gather in person, either due to illness or risk or fear or whatever the reason might be, I am confident that even while we are separated, that you are seeking to do God's will. As I am confident that those of us who are gathered here, that we are seeking to do God's will. And then Paul says these words at verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, first of all, I want you to understand, he's not saying work for your salvation. He says, work out your salvation. They were already saved. In verse 1, chapter 1, he refers to them as saints, people set apart to God. He's understanding they are saved. They were saved through faith in Christ. That's how all of us are saved. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is a gift of God. It has nothing to do with our works. None of us can boast. And yet, their salvation was not the destination. It was not the end. It was the beginning. Their salvation meant that they were justified, that Christ's righteousness was put on their account, just as if they'd never sinned. Their sin was forgiven. They now were born again. They had a spiritual birth so that the word of God had a new insight to them, to the person of God, had a new meaning to them, to the life of God, now became a reality for them. But that was a beginning. They're to work out their own salvation, which reminds us that we have a common salvation. All of us are called to love God supremely. We love him with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Amen? All of us have been called to love neighbors. In the Christian life, uniquely, we've been called to love enemies. We are called to make disciples. We are called to abide, to remain in his word. We are called to know his word, and we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. We are all collectively called to come to him, to take his yoke upon us, to learn of him. For he is gentle and lowly of heart. And we shall find rest for our souls. Now, these are our common workout. But each of us, as we work out our own salvation, recognize that the work that God is doing in you 
is different than the work that God is doing in the person next to you. And that's okay. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tell us that we've been saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, is a gift of God, not of works. But Paul continues in Ephesians 2, 10 and says, For we, believers, are his workmanship. Now, the word that we translate in our English Bibles, oftentimes as workmanship, is the Greek word poema. You are God's poem. You are God's work of art. You are God's craftsmanship. And God doesn't make junk. Amen? He is working in you to display you. Just like when your kids came home from kindergarten and they brought you a picture. You didn't critique it as though it was some lacking Rembrandt masterpiece. It's like, oh my gosh, your sense of perception here is so off. You, you just recognize that here was this beautiful thing that your child had created, and you put it on the refrigerator for everybody to see. Amen? That's what God is doing in heaven. Now, some, some of us are still in the rudimentary stages, right? Like, hey, the perception's a little off there. It's not like there's one eye over here, Picasso. But all of us are still a work in process. Amen? It is God who works in you. But before we see that God is working in us, we're reminded here to work out our own salvation. There, there is the danger of thinking, well, I am saved. Now God's doing everything. I don't have to do anything. And similarly, there is the danger, as we'll discover in a moment, of thinking that it's all about me and what I have to do. And it's not. It, it is a both and. And it's not simply a side by side. Christ is in us doing this work, as we'll discover. The battle is self. There is this struggle with self. Paul reminds us to work out this salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I just, I just want to encourage you. At first thought, we, we think of fear and trembling, like, oh my God, if you grew up in a religious system that was very performance-based, your sense of fear and trembling is, man, if I don't measure up, then God is going to condemn me. That's not the gospel. Once you have received Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the fear and trembling isn't the fear of condemnation, it is something else. What Paul is speaking of is this reverence for God. To understand that Jesus is Lord of all. That ultimately every knee will bow and recognize his lordship. And because he is Lord and has all authority, I want to live to glorify God. And it's a sense of reverence for his lordship in my life. There are two competing people for this throne. Jesus wants to occupy the throne of your life and self wants to occupy the throne of your life. And there's not room on that throne for both. And reverence and fear is this idea that I back off and give Jesus his rightful place on the throne of my life. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I just want to take another take on this fear and trembling, can I? Yeah, I, I don't think the Apostle Paul was thinking about this, but dare I suggest this, that what I believe to be theologically sound, I would suggest to you fear and trembling in the sense of FOMO, the fear of missing out. Here, here's what I mean by this. If you went through your whole life seeking after the things of the world and you got all the things of the world that you were seeking after and you looked back upon your life and you realized the emptiness of the things of this world and you realized that you had missed out on what Jesus was calling you to do. What Jesus was calling you to do. To be. How sorrowful to look back on, on all of the things of this world and recognize their emptiness and their shallowness and their transitory nature. 
and to realize that you had missed out on all that God wanted to do in your life, all that God wanted to do through your life to impact others. That's what we should be afraid of. We don't want to miss out on that. I can assure you, God is going to be most glorified when you discover and do that, and you're going to be most satisfied when you discover and do it. This is what you don't want to miss out on. Amen? So we see, first of all, that we work to do God's will. Second, we see that God works to enable you to do his will. God works to enable you to do his will. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you, reminding us that it is God's power. The Greek word that we translate works here is the Greek term energeo, from which you might imagine we derive our English term. That is the correct answer. How about the rest of you? Where were you? Okay. Yes, God is supplying the power. God works in you. See that? He doesn't work alongside of you. He doesn't work before you. He doesn't work after you. He's right in you. In other words, God is working in you by implanting in your mind, in your heart, desire that glorifies him. God is working in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Every time that you sense that God is telling you to talk to someone about him, every time that you sense that God is stirring you to listen to your neighbor, to engage with someone in a public space, to share your love of God with someone that you work with, to show kindness to somebody that you go to school with, to get involved in some area of service, in the things that he has been orchestrated throughout the entirety of your life. He is connecting the dots to make this incredibly beautiful picture of him and his kingdom. And every time that he does that and you yield to his will, God is glorified. His kingdom is magnified. And you are satisfied. All of these things that he stirs you to do is just part of this huge mosaic. It's just being sensitive to his leading. God is working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So I never, I never wanted to be a pastor. I, I encounter lots of people who wanted to be a pastor. And I think that is great and good and noble. It just wasn't the track that I was on. Uh, I was going to college. I was getting a degree. I had uh, a major in the behavioral sciences, in psychology. Uh, this is before I came to faith in Christ. I looked at these behavior systems, and I just thought, this is, is hooey. There, there was some of it that just made sense, and others that it's just like, no, nah, this is not my thing. So I, I withdrew from that. I got involved because I wanted to help people. My brother and I were involved in in music production, and he was getting his law degree to do entertainment law. I love my brother, and I thought, man, this would be cool. We'll do this together. So I changed my degree to poli-sci. I get involved in law school. Through law school and through the practice of law, I learned a, a way of thinking. If you've been around here for a while, I teach the Bible like an attorney, I make a case, I make an opening argument, here's what the evidence is going to show, I develop the argument, and then I make a close, an appeal, like a a closing argument. I think that way because that's who God made me to be. But he wasn't calling me simply to practice law for my comfort or well-being. He prepared me through that. And then I I got involved in, in a local church, my friend uh, Nick and Cheryl, Nick who, who's sitting here, uh, Nick was used by God to lead me to the Lord. My, my friends Nick and Cheryl were worshiping at a, a small church that met at a community center, and so I got involved setting up chairs. I got involved in, in doing the setup, and then I volunteered to get involved in kids' ministry because God put it on my heart, and I got invited by some guys I was playing softball with, Christian guys, mature guys, to teach a Bible study, and I prayed about it, and God put that on my heart, and I started doing that, and each one of the steps along the way was God preparing me to do what he had put in my heart in the first place to do. I wanted to help people. 
I didn't want to be a pastor. I was a nice Jewish boy. I came to faith in Christ, and, and God used me just to show that he could use the foolish things to accomplish his will. God is working in you. The desires that you have, every time you yield to him and do what he has called you to do, to be what he's called you to be, you are going to discover your satisfaction, your contentment. Salvation was not the end. It was the beginning of the journey. Amen? God works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It is God in you. It is the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we read about in John 14, Acts chapter 1, to empower us, to guide us, to enable us to do the things that he's called us to do. And Paul was at the very beginning of this letter encouraging us. I am confident that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. But it's not simply God's work alone, nor, God forbid, do you think it's your work alone, but it is God working in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. We're okay with that? Okay, so we, we see this idea of God's work. And now let's consider, we've seen the work of God, let's see the will of God. The will of God. So beginning at verse 14, he says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So first, encouragement about the will of God. Serve God with gladness. Serve God with gladness. He says, do all things without murmuring or complaining. So as, as I alluded to earlier, there's this conflict going on at the church at Philippi that is threatening not only their sense of unity, but it is threatening their witness to unbelievers outside of the church in the community. They're grumbling, they're complaining, they're murmuring as they are fighting amongst themselves and complaining, it is a poor witness to those outside. And what Paul's saying there is not simply do everything without murmuring and complaining. What he's saying is stop murmuring and complaining. He says stop it. There's no reason for it. It was reminiscent of the Jewish people being brought out of Egypt, headed towards the promised land, and there in the wilderness as God humbled them so that they would learn to depend upon him, so that they would discover his sufficiency. As God challenged their comfort, as God proved himself faithful, he prepared them to enter into the promised land. In the midst of it, they murmured and they complained. Oi, it's so humid. Moses, when are we going to be in Miami Beach? <laughs> I can do those jokes. You can't, by the way. <laughs> the psalmist declares in Psalm 100, verse 2, Serve the Lord with gladness. When we get to verse 17 and 18, Paul is going to tell us this is this great privilege to serve God. We should rejoice. And yet, it is easy when you are serving God by serving others, whether it's your friends, your family, your church, your community, to get frustrated, to murmur. To complain. Man, I, I tell you, what, what I do here, what we do here on Sunday mornings, it takes time when you're sowing seed, watering seed, pruning to see fruit come forward. It, it's generally not like miracle grow where you just go out in the backyard and there's Jack and the Beanstalk like, whoa, Shazam. <laughs> uh, most of the time, it, it's just a process of persevering and enduring. 
And so one of the things I like to do at home because I get immediate results, and most of my life is not characterized by immediate results, is dishes, laundry, trash. Oh, uh, man, not everybody in the house likes that I do laundry because you like white and red. It all goes together in the same load in my thinking. A lot of pink clothes in our house. Uh, I don't mind taking out the trash, don't mind doing dishes, don't mind cooking. It's all right. But there's times, there's times where I, I might be sitting there early in the morning and there's a sink full of dishes that looks like the Manhattan skyline and I was pretty confident that I washed those dishes before I went to bed. Where did all these dishes come from, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised people? Don't you know how <laughs> smack the rock like Moses? I... Nobody's awake at that hour. I'm, I'm saying this to the cat, you know, the, like the cat's bearing witness to my frustration. And it dishonors God. It has no place. There's times I got to confess here that it's frustrating that people come and they consume the things of God without contributing to a community. I'm not trying to call anybody out here. Don't, don't start looking down like, oh my gosh, shame, guilt. I'm just telling you, it's not you, it's me. It's my frustration. There's no place in that in the kingdom. Every single one of us, whether you're watching online, present here, we, we serve Jesus. And, and because you serve him, he's your master. There's no reason for me to judge anyone. There's no reason for any of us to judge anyone. Because each of us is to serve Christ. And therefore, because we understand that we have been called to serve God by serving others, we should do it with gladness and no complaining. Amen? I can't believe he said that to us. Who does he think he is? <laughs> Second, be an example of Jesus. Look at verse 15. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So these, these terms, blameless and, and faultless. So um, blameless is, is the idea of being pure. Faultless is the idea of being innocent, that we would be a wholly pure people. Now, we've we got to stop a second and un, unpack this. He says that you may become. So first of all, when you receive Christ, you are completely justified and you are completely sanctified in regard to your position. But Paul is urging us here to understand that we're working out our salvation, that we become innocent, that we become pure, that we become holy in our practice, set apart to God. He said that you become this blameless and faultless, what? Children of God. So understand that all of creation are, are God's offspring, but only those who have received Christ are part of the family of God, children of God. John chapter 1 at verse 12. That is your primary identity. If you see your primary identity as husband, wife, parent, child, what you do in your career, what you do in terms of your recreation, right? You, you know, like the difference between somebody who rides a bike and a cyclist is some people would say whether you wear spandex or not, right? The, the difference between somebody who rides a bike and a cyclist is the cyclist loves to ride a bike. But if your jam is the Rams, I know you've been praying this week, all right. If whatever your thing is, if that's your primary identity, that's what you're living to be molded and shaped. That's your idol. It's what you're becoming. And whatever that identity is, it will disappoint, and ultimately it will be taken from you. The only identity that is going to transcend time is your identity as a child of God. He, he says that we are in the midst of a culture that is crooked and perverse. 
It's the idea that the culture, to the extent that it is ignorant of God's truth, that it is contrary to God's truth, it is opposed to God's truth, is twisted and wicked. He says, in the midst of this culture, you are to shine as light. You see that with me at verse 15? You are to be an example of Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And then he told us in the Sermon on the Mount to all of his followers at the beginning of his ministry, he said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse, verse 14, you are the light of the world. Let people see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He says, you're the light of the world. You have no light of your own. Your light is the reflection of Jesus. You're an example of Jesus. You're an ambassador for Jesus. People should see your behavior, your attitudes, and your actions. And those attitudes and actions glorify the Father in heaven. To be an example of Jesus, the, the idea that to be an example of Jesus, we have to take his yoke upon us and walk with him and learn from him and learn of him so that we can represent him. Being a follower of Jesus is not simply, I stand against this issue, I stand against that issue. God forbid. Being a follower of Jesus is so much more than your political sense or I'm against this issue or that cultural issue. That's not how Jesus lived his life. He engaged sinners, the worst and most notorious sinners in his culture. And he did it with love, and he did it with grace, and he did it with compassion, but he did it without compromise. We're to be that example. We're to represent him to our families. Those in the household and extended. We're to represent them in our school, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. It is not simply what we stand against, but it is who we stand for. That's what it means to do the will of God. We don't murmur. We have no complaints. It's not like standing on your soapbox and decrying what's going on in the culture of the world. It's going to hell in a handbasket. No, it's not because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'd rather believe him than some pundit on social media. And the way to change the culture is not to stand on a soapbox and rail against it. Sure, you can get those who share your viewpoint to like your post. The way to change the culture is to engage it and show an example of who Jesus is. And it takes time, and it takes effort, and it's not comfortable. And it compels us to get out of our comfort living for self and to live for God. So we stop murmuring. We stop complaining. We choose to be an example of Jesus. And then in verse 16, we learn love and live the word. Learn love and live the word. Verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So we need to hold fast the word of God. In other words, we're going to need to learn the word of God. We need to love the word of God. And we need to live the word of God in order to do the will of God. That if we want to know whether something is God's will, to discern his will, pray and consider. One, is the attitude or action consistent with or contrary to the word of God? Is, is what you're thinking of doing contrary to the word of God? Then it's not his will. If it's consistent with the word of God, if it's not prohibited, it may be his will. Second, is the attitude or action likely to please or glorify God? In other words, there, there are some decisions that you, you really don't have to pray and fast and get counsel and think about. You know, somebody says, do you, do you need bags at the checkout stand? Oh, let me, let me fast and pray about this. God, what did you say about bags? Paper? Plastic? I, I... 
But it's amazing how many decisions that we make really have nothing to do with God. It's all about self, our comfort, our desire, our will. And we rationalize, well, God just wants me to do this, God wants me to do that. Well, why do you think that whatever you're choosing to do is going to glorify God or please God? If you've thought that through and God puts it on your heart, praise the Lord. If it's just you doing what you want to do, recognize it. Paul said that I might not have run and labored in vain. The, the, the idea here is using these athletic metaphors like running in a competition like the marathon. He used the term labor. He's talking about agonizing. He describes his ministry using those terms. He look, look, man, I have agonized to see you grow in Christ. I've labored. I've worked long hours, Paul would say. Let me know it's not in vain because, in fact, you're seeking to do God's will. The fact that you are seeking to do God's will and to live his will allows me to know that all of my labor was not in vain, Paul would say. He says to the Corinthians near the end of his first letter, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, for all of us, be steadfast, be immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord because your labor is not in vain. Don't, don't let the day-to-day -day control how you feel about serving God by serving others. The fruit will come forward if we continue and stand fast and persevere. Your labor for God is never in vain. Know that. And so Paul has talked to us about the work of God. And the will of God. Now let's contemplate the worship of God. Beginning of verse 17. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul likens his life and his ministry as a drink offering. We're, we're going to talk more about this. But understand, a drink offering is described in Numbers chapter 15, Leviticus chapter 23. It is a voluntary expression of adoration and devotion, effectively worship. So if someone had offered a, a ram, a lamb, a bull, an oxen as a sacrifice to God, the drink offering is about a quart of wine and it's poured out on the side next to this sacrifice on the altar of God. It is completely voluntary. Paul likens his service to this drink offering that's being poured out, see this, alongside the sacrifice and service of their faith. Paul was saying to the church at Philippi, because of what you are doing to seek to do God's will, because of who you have become to seek to do God's will, that service and sacrifice to God, I'm just coming alongside and being poured out next to you. In other words, Paul's saying, like, I recognize that I had some influence in the church at Philippi. But you're the sacrifice to God. Your desire to serve God by serving others is a sacrifice. It is worship to God. And my part in it, in influencing you to whatever extent I've influenced you, Paul would say, was simply poured out alongside. And so he says, I rejoice. I rejoice because you're doing it and I got to be part of it and God is glorified and you're satisfied and God's kingdom is magnified, so I rejoice. And he says, rejoice with me. Now, this is remarkable because Paul was under house arrest. He's facing an impending trial. He understands there could be adverse consequences, but Paul looked at his life and he said, my whole purpose for being, my whole purpose for this life is to honor God, to glorify God, to serve God by serving others. And so whether I live or die, I'm going to be content because I trust God's will in all these things. And you can rejoice 
with me because God's will is perfect and God is good and he is trustworthy. And so I want you to consider with me. In the battle between your lordship, self, and the battle of Christ's lordship, As you contemplate your life, are you continuing to seek to do his will, to serve God by humbly, sacrificially, selflessly serving others as an expression of worship and adoration? I want you to contemplate that for a moment. The ushers are are going to come forward to present to us the elements of communion. And while while they do that, I want to explain the drink offering to you. Can I explain this drink offering to you? I I know when people come by, it's distracting, but you with me on this? Okay, so the drink offering. God enters into a covenant with the Jewish people at Sinai. He gives them all of these commandments in regard to worship, and he expresses a sacrificial system where there's all sorts of sacrifices. There's sacrifices for sin. There's sacrifices for thanksgiving. There's sacrifices that are made for vows. There are all types of sacrifices that are made in this system. You okay with that? With me so far? Here, the drink offering is given to them while they're still in Sinai. In the wilderness, they haven't made it into the promised land. But most of the sacrifices that the Jews entered in this covenant while they were still in the promised land, while they're still in Sinai, they will observe in Sinai in the wilderness before they get to the promised land. But not the drink offering. The drink offering is first observed when they enter into the promised land. They are partaking of the drink offering to honor God, to commemorate. God was faithful to his promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Jewish people. He brought us into the promised land just like he said he would. But here's the thing. I need you guys to stay with me. The drink offering is completely devoted to God. Most of the sacrifices, a portion is given to honor God. A portion is given for the priests, Levites, those who are dedicated to service to God. And the offerer would partake of a portion, but not the drink offering. The drink offering, the whole thing is poured out as an expression of adoration, devotion, worship to God. That's The Old Testament construct on the drink offering. Here's where it shifts. And this is what I want you to see with me. How Jesus changes this in the New Testament, the New Covenant. He takes the bread, Luke 22. He's in the upper room. He says, this is my body which is broken for you, right? Do this in remembrance of me. That's the sacrifice, his life. Then he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's the drink offering. But here's the difference. In the Old Testament, God enjoyed it while the people offered. In the New Testament, God enjoys it while we partake with him. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. What motivates us to seek God's will, to do God's will, to serve God by serving others, which is contrary to everything about flesh and our desire for self, is simply gratitude for a mature understanding of what Jesus has done for us and saving us from our sin that looks horrible to God, paying the penalty with his life, his blood, and then restoring us in relationship and giving us life. So I want to take a moment to give us a chance to reflect. Just close your eyes and and seek God and we'll partake together in just a moment.
Father, I pray that everything that happens in this place and in our lives and through our lives would be motivated by love for you, gratitude for you in response to all that you've done for us. We thank you that you've invited us to partake now as we partake of your body broken for us as we partake of the bread as that symbol may we be reminded of your sacrifice as we partake of the cup let us be reminded that we have been welcomed in that we can pour out our lives as you've poured it out for us we thank you in Jesus name Amen let's partake